So before I get into the bulk of the video, I have a disclaimer that capitalism is bad and I don't know how to fix it. Now that that's out of the way, I wanted to talk today about bookstores, particularly local independently owned bookstores. I'm coming at this as someone who worked at a local independent bookstore in my town for just over a year. And then prior to that, I spent about six months working at Barnes & Noble. I was working there full time and then got laid off when they did a bunch of uh, full-time position cuts. So I've been on sort of both sides of the bookstore world in terms of large chain and then independent store. I think there's a lot of things people don't really know about how local independent bookstores operate and how they are successful. Um, and there's actually a lot of ways to support them that don't necessarily involve spending all of your money and not having any more money. I've come up with 10 different strategies for supporting your local independent bookstores, or even if you don't have one in your area, how to support any independent bookstore of your choice, uh, even if it's a little further away from where you live. Although I said a lot of these don't involve spending all your money, my first way that you can support them is by buying books there. It's good to buy books, particularly because as I noticed when I was working at an independent bookstore, uh, the vast majority of the people who come in regularly and make large purchases and really seem to be getting all of their books through the independent bookstore look a little more like this than like this. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, but uh, eventually we're going to need to shift things a little bit. Just a little like sub clause to this one. I hate paying full prices for books. I'm a used bookstore person through and through. Uh, I'm also a big thrift book shopper. Um, I really am not used to paying full prices and it hurts me to do so. But even so, I've come around to the idea of when possible, uh, even if it's just once a year, like at the holidays, you want to buy a gift for someone and you make the choice to pay full price at an indie bookstore. Or what I do is if I'm on vacation, I'll go to the independent bookstore wherever I am. A lot of times when you buy a book, you get a uh, bookmark from that place. So it's like a nice souvenir that's a little more in depth and memorable than what you might get, like a little trinket or whatever. Uh, this book I got on my vacation to P-Town this summer. It has a nice little custom bookmark and I'm always going to remember where I got this book. So it helps to make books a little more memorable. Uh, make your library a little more special, and it's a way to spread that support around without breaking the bank. The second big way, uh, if you make the choice to buy a book at an independent bookstore, is to look for sections or displays where the store has multiple copies of that book in stock. Bookstores, particularly independent bookstores, especially the smaller ones, do not have a lot of real estate to work with. They don't have a lot of shelf space. So most of the books they order, they're going to be ordering in ones or twos. If they've made the choice to get seven books or 10 books or even 20 books and you see them on a display, they are really hoping that that is a book that's going to sell for them. And it's also likely that it's a book that they believe in, that the publisher believes in, and that they're really interested in sharing with the public. The other major reason to look for these displays and books that they have larger quantities of is that the bookstore actually gets a better margin on books when they buy more of them from the publisher. So you're actually buying a book where the bookstore has gotten a better deal and therefore it works out a little bit better for them financially. The book that I got in P-Town was from a staff recommended display. Um, and in an independent bookstore, it's much more likely to be a display that was actually made by a staff member for a reason and for the reason that they actually enjoyed the book. Whereas almost all of the displays when I worked at Barnes Noble just came down from corporate. We got a little paper and then made the displays exactly how they told us to. Um, even like a staff recommendation section, we didn't really have like a real one. I don't know where those suggestions came from, but it was just sort of handed down to us. Third way to support local bookstores. This one does not necessarily even involve money. A lot of times this one is totally free. Go to events. This helps so much. Uh, a lot of times events for authors are free. The reason that this is so important for bookstores is that um, when a bookstore can show a publisher and an author's publicist that they've had good attendance for an event, 
that makes it much more likely that they're going to get bigger name authors in the future and therefore going to sell more books. It might seem like publishers are not going to be like keeping tabs on every little bookstore and how they're invented. But when I was working at my indie bookstore, it was absolutely the case that the publisher or the publicist would call the day after an event and ask a staff member how many people were there, also how many books were sold, but the attendance numbers themselves are also really important. So there, there definitely is that feedback. You can also just see some like really great people for free, particularly if your bookstore is in like a city or an urban area where uh, it's more likely to be convenient for an author to travel there. Or in the case of my bookstore that I worked at, we were um, right across the street from Mount Holyoke College. So we were able to partner with the college and several departments on campus to bring like bigger name people um, to the store and kind of pitch in on any sort of expenses that go with it. One word of caution with author events, um, you might want to, if you haven't heard of an author before or you just haven't heard anything about the book, just kind of do a little digging and see if it's a self-published work or not. Not that self-published stuff is necessarily bad, but there are like a lot of people who are self-publishing or maybe vanity projects who are constantly contacting people who work at independent bookstores to try to set up events. Some local authors and like small authors are awesome, but uh, the quality is not necessarily always there. So if you're interested in starting to go to some events and you want to make sure that the first couple ones you go to are going to be good for you, um, go to one that has kind of more promotion that are associated with a publisher that you've heard of, and then you can always kind of branch out and experiment from there. Number four, um, it's really important to understand that independent bookstores um, and basically any bookstore at all almost never has control over their prices. I know that there are big differences in price depending on if you go to like a Barnes and Noble versus a small bookstore, but in terms of the price that's like put on the back of the book, that is set by the publisher. The only reason that Barnes & Noble can get away with having all of their bestsellers be 30% off all the time is that they're ordering so many of them from the publisher that they're getting a much better margin on the books and they can afford to take that discount off and lose that money themselves because of the quantity of books that they're buying and selling. For non-book items like gifts or office supplies or accessories, anything like that, the same metric still kind of applies. You're working with companies that are making or distributing those products. They're going to give you a better price if you buy 500 of something rather than 5, 10, or 15. I was the merchandise buyer for all of the Mount Holyoke merchandise for the Odyssey because we were the campus bookstore as well. So I was in charge of buying all like the sweatshirts and water bottles and uh, the school supplies like the notebooks and there were a ton of times where students would come in and get mad at me about the price of our five-star notebooks not understanding that the reason they can get it for five dollars less at target is because target is buying thousands upon thousands of those notebooks and i'm ordering 20 for the semester even if you're not a big reader it helps to buy non-book stuff at independent bookstores there's a ton of gift items and accessories and office supplies and notebooks that you can find at bookstores. I think non-book items at bookstores have kind of gotten a bad rap. Um, there's a New Yorker cover that shows a bookstore filled with merchandise and t-shirts and mugs and a customer being pointed to a little lower shelf where there's only like 10 or 15 books. Um, kind of a joke on like the Barnes & Noble department where you see a giant display of pillows and home goods or their new giant toy section. And this is all true, but the reason that that's happening is because these businesses are trying to stay afloat and trying to get people to come in and buy something, even if they're not going to be buying a book because either they don't want to read it or they're getting a much cheaper price on Amazon. These non-book items may not necessarily always be the best deal at your local independent bookstore because of the pricing issues that I've mentioned before, but they do a ton for the bottom line. At the Odyssey, uh, like I said, we're also the campus bookstore for Mount Holyoke, and that business in sweatshirts and water bottles and everything that I said totally helps to sustain us. So if you can go in and browse and buy a gift for a friend, um, it really helps out to pick up a couple items, even if it's not a book. An area of this where small bookstores actually might have an advantage as well is that 
local bookstores are much more likely to um, work with local artists and people making items. And so you're able to find local gifts that you wouldn't find elsewhere. And in that case, the prices might be a little more reasonable than something that's available from Target as well. So as I mentioned before, independent bookstores don't have the space or the overhead to carry a really wide selection of titles. They try to do a good job of representing different interests and maybe also having a specific focus for the store, but they're just not going to be able to have the selection of a larger store and especially not the selection that Amazon has. But a way that you can kind of get around this and really help support local bookstores is by ordering books through them, through special orders, or pre-ordering titles that you know that you're going to buy once they come out. A lot of people don't know that you can special order, um, but the vast majority of local bookstores are thrilled to be able to order books for you. You might be surprised at the turnaround time of the special orders as well. A lot of bookstores can get books in within two or three days, which rivals the shipping time of many websites that you might order from. This is also a really good way to participate in supporting local bookstores, even if you don't have one in your area as well. You can order a book from a bookstore that's not near you and then have them ship it to you. It's essentially the same as ordering a book from a larger website. You're getting it within a similar amount of time, but you're supporting an independently run store. For any audiobook fans out there, I know Audible is like this massive, gigantic thing that is ever present um, and keeps adding content and has originals now. But if you're interested in finding an alternative that is not connected to Amazon, and that supports local stores, you should check out Libro.fm, which I eternally confuse with Last.fm when I think of it in my head. So here are my top five artists on my Last.fm account, which I used uh, for the last time probably five years ago. Um, I would still totally listen to all of these today. So Libro.fm is an alternative that has Somewhat fewer titles, but a lot of the same popular titles that Amazon does. You can sign up for a membership similar to Audible if that's your style, but you can also just buy audiobooks a la carte um, and not have to worry about like a monthly membership fee. I'm not shilling for them, um, but it is a cool way to support your local bookstore. You can either choose to have some of the proceeds from your sale go to a specific local bookstore or to all of the participant um, local bookstores in general, and then it gets divided up between them. To be honest, the amount that the bookstore gets is uh, kind of a drop in the bucket, but if a ton of people switched over, that might be different. Another point that I wanted to address that I think is a huge difference between chain bookstores and independent bookstores, um, and another reason why supporting independent bookstores is important is that in general, um, it's likely that sort of like your quality of shopping experience is gonna be a little better at an independent bookstore particularly because independent stores don't have any motivation or any drive to pressure you into buying memberships or signing up for credit cards or doing all of the things that endlessly feel like you need to be subjected to when you try to buy something from Barnes & Noble. As someone who worked there, I can guarantee you that the person who is behind the counter most likely does not want to be shilling those things to you, but needs to because there are secret shoppers who will observe and alert their bosses if they aren't doing that, and then you'll get penalized. Your percentage of memberships is tracked, so it really matters how good you are at selling people them, um, and that takes up brain space. So it's likely that an employee at an independent bookstore is gonna have a little more room in their head to actually talk with you about books and recommend titles to you rather than needing to get out a certain line of a script in order to try to sell you a membership. When I was working at Barnes & Noble, I still definitely recommended books to people, but when I've already had to ask you five questions and tell you three different things about a membership, it's likely that you're not going to want to talk to me anymore. Like regardless of how charming and beautiful I am, there's only so much of me you can take when I'm behind the counter wanting you to pay me $25 a year. Also in an independent bookstore, you're a lot more likely to find um, really tailored staff recommendations, um, unique displays, things that are tied into the local area and books that the employees actually care about and are read and really recommending and are passionate about. So if you want to get that more customized experience, even if you're just browsing around and want to talk about it and you don't buy anything, that's an interaction that a lot of employees are going to be really happy to have with you and it's a great way to find out about new titles. Both Barnes & Noble and independent bookstores are slowly but surely being killed off by Amazon, so if you're going to support one, why not support the indies?
So I got to nine points when I was brainstorming this video, and then I couldn't think of a tenth one, but I really didn't want to have a list with just nine things on it. So instead of a tenth point, I'm just going to read you the entirety of my district award that I won as a Barnes & Noble staff member. Um, I'm actually wearing my Barnes & Noble lanyard just to bring back the good old days. Um, and you can see my above and beyond pin right here. Uh, I won this right at the beginning of my time working there and maybe worked there a month. And I had just been promoted to full-time uh, cashier position. So it was my job a lot of the time to sell those memberships. So here we go. How to hit the ground running. Jennifer Manglass was hired in September and has already made a huge impact on the store's membership numbers. On her very first cashier chaining shift, she sold a membership to a customer without any aid from the head cashier, turning to her only when she needed to ask, so how do I keep this in? Her exemplary ability to hit the ground running with memberships led her to a 3.45% membership conversion number her very first week on the job. During double discount days, she was one of our best performers, posting an 8.57% conversion rate for the week. While being trained in newsstand, she impressed even our longtime head cashier with her ability to learn on the fly and zone maintenance an entire gondola in the blink of an eye. On the floor during her first shelving training shift, she impressed her MODs with the ability to shelve multiple H carts while simultaneously attending to the needs of every customer she encountered. With these kind of results and numbers, it was a no-brainer to promote Jen to the position of head cashier when it became available last week. When challenged by our store manager to work on her year-to-date numbers, she met the challenge. It's only Tuesday, and she's at 4.21% after two long days at cash wrap. In the process of writing this entry, she just chimed in over the headset to say, I got another one. So long story short, fuck membership rates and conversion numbers. Go support an indie, order a book through special orders, order a book to get shipped right to your house from an independent bookstore, maybe get an audiobook through last.fm, go to an event, take books off of displays, and just crush it. Kill it. I believe in you. You can do it make sure that we still have some bookstores left.